Hi, I would like to discuss my postdoc projects that I'm going to suggest. Um, I'm Richelle Bilderbeek, uh, Shell from Shell and Company, Re from Riemden, Richelle Bilderbeek. I'm a postdoc in Orsa Johansson's research group, part of immunology, genetics and pathology at the University of Uppsala. You can find my presentation here. Um, this is uh, the license. This is my research group and the guy with the arrow pointing to him, that's me. So the goal of this talk is to, that I'll suggest, in this talk I will suggest actually three research projects and I want to know if it's a good idea or a bad idea three times. So already Frida and Agnes um, heard this presentation. They thought it was a good idea, but they don't know how much I've changed since then. So there was there were three oh there are three projects. Um, but let's first do the second one. So the second project used to be one with me and Therese. Um, but Fatima, she killed it by reading literature. So that's a good job. Well done, Fatima. Um, so I'm going to discuss two projects. One is I've I worked on today, so it's a bit young of an idea, so that's why there's no second author here. It's about when to consider epistase in GWAS studies, that's a working title. And the other project, which I'll describe afterwards, is by me, uh, Adrien, Torgny and Orsa, of course. It's called the cost effectiveness of classical and machine learning algorithms in GWAS studies. Something like that. It's a it's a working title, but I'll describe this in a bit more detail than the first one. But the first one builds up the story nicely, so that's why I'll describe it first. So when I started my postdoc, also I had uh, two, uh, two, two good ideas uh, that I should be doing in my postdoc. That's what professors do, they have ideas. So, all right, I started reading the literature. So I needed to do machine learning ML, always is machine learning in this talk. I need to do machine learning in GWAS association studies. Yeah, genome-wide association studies, with GWAS association studies, it's a bit double. Um, so what's so cool about machine learning? So there are multiple facets of it, but in this talk, the most important thing about machine learning is that's about non-linearity. So let's say we have two, uh, um, two, two groups of coordinates and with the color different, means that there are different classes. So we have the, the black dots and the white dots and if you would have to design, uh, and if you have to, so if you need to separate them cleanly, for this you need you need a curly line, you need a non-linearity. And linear models, by definition, can't do that. It will be a straight line. Um, whereas machine learning algorithms uh, provide for such a non-linearity. So that's why you use machine learning in this context. There's also things like training and all those things. And, and, and but in this context, mostly non-linearity. So in the context of GWAS studies, um, that means in the context of biologies, non-linearity, it is uh, one of the processes is epistasis. So epistasis is when genes and alleles don't add up or subtract or like make you smaller or bigger, for example. But if there's a multiplicative effect, um, so for example, here we have mice, um, the first two alleles, uh, it's a diploid organism, it has two alleles. The first two determine your fur color, and if you have the two recessive uh, alleles, then you're brown, else you're black. Um, that's already a nonlinear effect, it's not as a brownishness or a blackishness. Um, so that's already nonlinear. But there's an even stronger nonlinearity is that if you have recessive, if the second gene, if you have the recessive version of that, you're an albino, regardless of your fur color. So this is already nonlinear, but the albinoism is even more nonlinear. It's like if you, uh, like it is like, a, so if you determine the skin color, you multiply it by zero if you're an albino, and then you're white, for example. That's how you can see it. Times zero always is always zero, is always white. So that's nonlinear, nonlinear. that's multiplicative. So the question is, is it worth it um, to use machine learning algorithms? So uh, this is an elephant in a round room because it, machine learning, there is definitely, uh, it can definitely be worth it. So, and, and then you can, you can easily prove that, although it's not been proven yet, and that's why I suggest this project. So if the data, if our GWAS data, which is a relationship between SNPs, so, um, so here we have 
So you have three SNPs. Um, either SNP is zero or one. Zero is the major allele, the most frequent allele, and one is the is is the, is the one with best. Actually, that's the major allele, but it is the, this is the, the, the most common variant. Then, um, so that means you can have either a zero or one at and and these SNPs. There are the SNPs can also be two, three, four on each location. Then, if the trade value is very nonlinear. Um, actually, I use this for equation 10 to the power of n, where n is the number of rare alleles, which is the number of ones. If you do it like that, uh, then it's uh, clearly nonlinear. Um, uh, if you have only one one, you have 10. If you have two ones, you have 100. And if you have three ones, you have 1,000. So that's a uh, strong nonlinear. And you could argue that um, if you would simulate data like that, and you would use a linear model to to get this relationship out of it, it won't find it because maybe each of these SNP on its own contributes too little to the big picture. So it's not picked up, but that a machine learning algorithm can detect this nonlinearity and thus can find this uh, strong nonlinear relationship. So this is a bit of a, this bit of a not worked out well idea. It's a bit coarse still. So the null hypothesis of that research would be that Linear and machine learning methods detect an equal amount of known nonlinear signals. So to use uh, John Travolta to see when it when it budges, when the when our simulated data is so nonlinear that you really should that 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 everyone will say no, you don't use linear models here. You definitely must use machine learning methods here because they are nonlinear. Um, and the question is, where is that area? And so when, you, when for settings where we can reject that null hypothesis, we say, no, you should definitely use machine learning methods there. And for settings where this null hypothesis holds, we say, nah, linear models are good enough there. And the setup is very straightforward, but um, I didn't discuss it, and don't discuss it in too much detail anyways. So the method is very simple. Um, I make different genotype phenotype maps, for example, linear one, or that they're strongly nonlinear and even stronger nonlinear and even stronger, stronger nonlinear. So I make such a genotype phenotype map. And of course, the stronger this relationship is nonlinear, um, then machine learning should will come out as superior. So it is, it's a, so that's very simple. So we have a strong, we have a non-linear mapping or a very strong nonlinear mapping. I'm then I'm going to simulate the quantitative phenotypes. I want to use Epigen for it. Epigen is a very recent program that can do that. Uh, it simulates, um, uh, it allows you to do epistatic effects uh, based on um, genomic data, for example, from HEPMAP3. And when I have that relationship between genotype and phenotype, then I can use tools to measure if they can bring back those uh, relations that I've put in, if they can infer them, uh, if they, they also make the same predictions. For the linear models, I want to use, let's say, Gemma or Regini. But for the machine learning method, I'll probably use one of the, um, one of the methods I show in later slides, or I ask with Adrian uh, or something like that. Well, then we have, so we have some known relationships. We have some um, results that the predictions, say the, the predictions discover some relationships and then we're going to measure the error between those two like I and the, there's a metric called the uh, area under curve uh, receiver operator characteristic I'll show that in a later slide as well uh, but that's I feel a way to measure error and it's commonly being done so to to streamline things a bit I don't want to use uh, infinitely big data sets I want to tailor it to the size of the northern Swedish population health study. So those are a thousand people that live in the approximately thousand people that live in the north of Sweden. Um, and that makes it a smaller data set than UK Biobank. And I feel it need not to be big uh, to prove that machine learning methods really sometimes are needed. So this is a bit coarse, but this is a bit like the general idea. This is relevant because it's unexpectedly novel to simulate nonlinear GWAS association. So I expected um, that this was already been done, uh, but this API, uh, what it was called, EpiGen, uh, just was published uh, last year. Uh, and it looks uh, exactly what I need for this case. 
So I didn't expect that. So um, that that makes it already new. I will. Um, uh, so it's, it's it's something new. It's also the first study to quantify the strength of epistasis needed for machine learning to be superior. So when can you say when can you safely say uh, under ideal conditions as a simulated data when can you safely say nah we're going to use linear models here because um, epistasis does not pay enough of a role. So it will be it it will be give a guideline when you should do that or not when you really should use machine learning or not and then the question is in biology is there this amount of epistasis yes no and then we can say all right no we should definitely do or do not use machine learning on real data that's also not a question so that, that that's my first project uh, a bit coarse detail so i will develop this a bit more um, depending on your ideas on this Second project uh, is the elephant in a square room. Uh, is it worth it? So machine learning. So this is a talk by Adrien uh, when he got his postdoc, and also Adrien was in the same thing. He didn't want to use machine learning because it's cool. You really need to carefully consider impact, clinical, and societal relevance. So Adrien and I are on the same page, although he was half a year ahead or something. But I asked like around, like, do you think machine learning should be used? in GWAS studies if to detect associations. So the first person I uh, learned about is Professor Richard Janssen. So he's the, the professor in bioinformatics in Groningen. Uh, that's why I know him, I've spoken to him. And he said, yeah, Richel, the data is too noisy to warrant non-linearity. He says that, um, that it makes no sense to use such a sharp tool for such muddy data. Well, when I showed this to Adrien, I said, yeah, but uh, Professor Richard Jans, machine learning can handle noise better. So those two people, they, um, they well, they more, it doesn't seem to, uh, to, to match, the, they, they have different uh, ideas here. But um, then when he's, uh, so with, with Richard Jans, he's clearly, he's more or less a linear uh, model fanboy, you could argue that. Especially the next one is also a linear model fanboy, because this is Piotr Prince. He's one of the main developers of Gemma. Genome-wide efficient mixed model associations. So uh, Gemma is rather new. It detects associations using linear mixed models. And Piotr says, there's a when you use machine learning methods in GWAS studies, he says there's a negligible increase in accuracy, but at the cost of using profoundly more resources, that the calculation will take way, 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 way longer. Um, for a few percentage in accuracy. So that was his point. So here we have two linear model fanboys. So I started looking into the literature. And then, uh, for example, here we find uh, Sarah McEachern at Niels Volkert, machine learning for precision medicine. So that's very interesting for a very recent paper. So they claim that uh, this paper, and I'll show it in the next slide, found that nonlinear classification methods so this is not exactly GWAS, but it's just uh, they use it's a it's classification in uh, case control studies. So I'm more interested in uh, quantitation, um, quantitative um, associations, as in that the phenotype detect that the, the the phenotype is like a trait that has a value. But they say they say that in nonlinear classification methods, uh, machine learning performs considerably be better. Better. So classification you now always use machine learning. So I looked into the paper and actually, so they had some figures um, and I just uh, used to paint to, you can see that there was a rather, I tried to be as careful as I could, but uh, you see there's some, it's not pixel perfect. So what I did, I meshed together all their figures at the left hand side, I've meshed together all the linear models and at the right hand side, I meshed together all the machine learning models. And at the Y, so there were a lot of settings. So uh, there are also different settings. So you could argue it's a bit unfair, but I just used all the settings they presented. And the higher the value, the better. So this is the um, receiver operator characteristic area under curve. Uh, goes from 0.5 to 1. You could say from 0 to 1. Um, but let's use 0 0.5. 0 0.5 means that, uh, that the, the program classifies something as random, that it randomly says, ah, oh, it's this or that. Uh, whereas 1.0 means it will always correctly classify something. 
So for the linear models, you see that uh, so the higher is better, and you see that the linear models for exactly the same value do actually considerably better, or let's say equally well. So I would say that the study that these uh, machine learning people recommend it doesn't really prove their points. They even said perform considerably better. Well, I don't see call this considerably better over that myself. So, uh, but I found another guy. So if uh, Javier de Velasco Oriol, he says machine learning methods have been proven to perform better in detecting candidate SNPs. So um, predicting associates is exactly what I want. And predicting complex genetic diseases, that's exactly what our group loves. Such as type 2 diabetes, influenza bowel syndrome and obesity. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through all these three papers. Let's see um, how much this holds because machine learning methods have been proven to perform better. Proven to perform better, keep that in mind. So the first study, type 2 diabetes, so it was actually a table, but I put it in a plot. So at, the, at this axis, so here we have some settings, uh, and here we have the, again, the area under curve. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, I think also the receive operator characteristic. And uh, 1.0 is best, and 0.5 is uh, random classification or, or worse. So and he claims that the machine learning method, so there are three methods. We have a uh, uh, logistic regression, so that's not linear, but it's a classical method. So I, I, I use the abacus to indicate it's not a machine learning method. Here we have random forest, here we have support vector machine. Uh, there are three ways that they treated their data. And you see that indeed that the random forest on average does better than the logistic regression for all data sets. But if you take a look at the standard error, I would say it's not significantly better. I would say it's like more or less the same. Um, so the second, so I'm not convinced that here uh, uh, machine learning is proven to be better. Also the second study, um, this is a table, just copied the table here. So again, here is an area under curve, which should be one optimally. So I just highlight, um, so these are two settings. Uh, this is a disease, this is a disease. Uh, the area on the curve is actually for the logistic regression is better. And and here it's it's the same. So I don't know if this is not proven to be better. I don't think this, the support factor machine or the gradient boost the trees do better than the linear regression here. Also the third study even doesn't do a comparison. So uh, this guy, this uh, Javier, I'm not sure where I got that from, this idea. So, uh, so I conclude that I just showed a lot of fanboys here. So if you ever see a paper that convincingly shows that machine learning outperforms classic methods in the context of GWAS in an association, especially on quantitative um, uh, predictions or associate detecting quantitative effects, please let me know because I have not been able to find them. It's always biased or um, only linear, or only machine learning algorithms or only linear algorithms, but never one against the other. So, and then I was thinking about, um, like there's this tendency to always use machine learning nowadays. And then I found this paper. Uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll, I'll show it in a, in a, in a jiffy. And um, so there was also this in, in, uh, in genetics, there's this idea that we now should sequence all DNA instead of just sampling a, a couple of SNPs. So there's this tendency, well, just sequence everything. And there was this paper by a Quick et al. This is a, a Harvard guy. And it's about, so uh, it is sequencing and imputation in GWAS. Cost effective strategies to increase power, this is statistical power, and genomic coverage across diverse population populations. So the word cost effective is interesting here. So um, this is a figure uh, from them. Um, I, this is a sub figure, but, uh, so I just took the, took the strategies, they have four groups. And they used three different sequencing machines, which have a different amount of SNPs that they sequence. Of course, this is more expensive than that one. The more SNPs, the more it costs. And at the axis, they showed uh, how much participants they actually sequence. And at the y-axis, they show uh, how many Im participants are imputed that you use, like say, a reference, uh, reference genomes uh, to impute the data from the SNPs you got. And the colors are the statistical power. Also, what you see here are the are the diagonal are the dashed lines. These are uh, cost effect. These are equal costs. So, if you want to um, 
spent this much money uh, that is represented by this dashed red line then ideally you spend it on sequencing let's say 300 participants and imputing 7000 that will give you the most statistical power for your money and that inspired me to do something the same with machine learning algorithms so i'm going to suggest two null hypotheses here i'm going to say that classical and machine learning methods are equally good at detecting quantitative associations of course we're going to reject that null hypothesis as well but we have to prove like we have to write down what we're going that how we're going to disprove this well but then this is also new classical and machine learning methods give the same predictive power per cpu hour so instead of money i want to use cpu hour and it also ties in nice with a suggestion from um, Piotr Prince he said it's not worth it computationally like yes it does give better predictions but maybe not per CPU hour and also this I want to use uh, I want to apply it to the northern Swedish population health study as well um, to see um, to get an idea like should we use machine learning method as rather smaller cohort uh, as well or do we do, do are classical models um, good enough on this maybe very noisy data that it's not warranted to use machine learning methods so this is how figure one of that paper will look like so at the x-axis we have data strength for example the number of participants I keep it vague on purpose here because it's just a, a, an idea uh, that may be rejected by the group so you have data strength and the y-axis we have statistical power whatever that is probably the same thing as the paper and um, which use the genotype uh, with the money for for sequencing and then i predict something like this that linear models have lower statistical power based on the same data and these two machines so that's why i use the abacus here linear models and for the machine learning algorithm that they do better and one or two does even better than the other this is just guess this is just an illustration of um, of what I think may come out of it but it can be completely different but this is what you expect but then the new thing oh yeah the first um, this if we have this landscape if we can predict from the data strength and the method either linear or machine learning we can even make predictions so we can say that if we use the northern Swedish health population we know the data strength whatever we express that in we can predict it using a linear model and from that we can predict the statistical power from the machine learning models or the other way around but I think this is the more fun way to go um, so then we can prove um, that how that our analysis works well like it should be weird if these two globes uh, would be completely off the line although data strength is very vague still statistical power is very vague so so it's a bit um, um, so it's a bit vague but it's well you expect it to be more or less on the line but the new thing is uh, is this to use statistical power per CPU hour so uh, at the x-axis we have data strength again at the y-axis we have statistical power per CPU power per CPU hour and we expect that linear models that they give you the most statistical power per CPU hour like they get to they, they give um, they do less calculations to reach their peak to be done whereas machine learning methods they take longer because they do more complex calculations so this is also what we expect and the north and speech population health study will be somewhere on this line and maybe we can also probably we can also predict that uh, if it's if um, if we find it here then we can also predict the other two so for the team because um well to be uh, uh, to go into a bit more depth i've asked Torgny and he agrees um, if of course oh, so the team is of course also is boss and i also ask Torgny to to be responsible for getting the statistical power right so he's just because he's our statistics boy he's, he's in charge of that adrien he will the machine learning defender or a guy uh, because he's also working exactly on that and i'll use the i'll pick the linear model so probably i'll be using gamma or reginy there as well just my favorite models or perhaps the ones that probably the ones that have been published and adrian will do the same and the three of us have to agree on our methods and also has to agree that we actually going to do it uh, also the papers already online uh, it's, you can see it being written so that you can see that um, 
I actually write down the methods before I get the results and including the hypothesis. This is relevant because it is unexpectedly novel to be neutral towards classical and machine learning methods and do a fair comparison. So I think it's, well, maybe okay to say that the people I showed you were all fanboys for either linear models or machine learning methods. And then um, I haven't seen a good uh, comparison or, or the conclusion that we're drawn were right. Uh, I did see comparisons with the, I think that it showed that they're equally good maybe. So, so that's new. Also, it is novel to have a guideline on the computational cost. So I know I've, I've seen uh, one paper who attempts this a bit, but that's on, on, a, on but that was on Bayesian methods and I didn't touch on those because I feel they're less used in our field at the moment. And what is novel, and this may be the case, let's assume that machine learning methods uh, discover more associations on quantitative traits, then maybe they will also detect new associations for this Northern Swedish Population Health Study. So that conclu concludes this um, my talk. That I so I'll have three papers here. One is half of Orsa's idea. Uh, that she discussed, but I'll be using half one and I'll be more ha also focusing on the uh, if it's worth it uh, in CPU time. Perhaps there will be another paper that comes out of it if there are some machine learning uh, found associations are there in, in, in that cohort. I can't predict if that's going to happen. Um, and there's another paper uh, when machine learning is biological essential so when we put when we simulate data with we know it's very non-linear and if we can prove the boundary between yes it's worth it and no it's not worth it from a biological point of view so i think at least the first and the third paper are reasonable to start uh, but uh, this is what i want to say and i look forward to hear your questions or ideas criticism you can email me that's all fine um, because well, the Zoom, uh, this an online session is not the optimal thing to uh, to discuss. Um, yeah, so definitely you can send me email. Of course, you can find a presentation here and uh, hit me. And that was my presentation.